Hello and good afternoon and welcome to a webinar on how smart barristers stay visible and win more instructions. I'm Bernard Savage, I'm with a business development agency that specialises in working with barristers and lawyers called Size 10 and a Half Boots and we're bringing this webinar to you today on behalf of the Bar Council. Okay, um, what I want to do over the next 45 minutes or so is help you uh, really have more confidence in the way that you promote yourselves and your practice and to be a lot more focused in how you do that and in so doing I'll provide you some practical guidance along the way. Um, by way of very brief personal introduction, uh, myself and my business partner Doug McPherson have both come from industry in uh, big blue chip organisations and then moved across the professional services market and over the last eight and a half years or so we've been working exclusively with professional service firms and you can see a flavour of some of the chambers up and down the country that we've been working with on the right hand side. Okay, that's enough of that, let's get on with things. First things to say and um, I, I'm just perhaps stating the obvious here but we're, we're operating here in a market that's forever changing and there's two ways you can look at this isn't there, you can look at it in terms of threats, the threats posed by um, the abolition of legal aid or you can look at it in terms of the opportunities afforded by initiatives like direct access but either way we're in a much uh, tougher environment and one that means this simply being a technical expert alone is not enough anymore buyers are far more discerning um, they have higher expectations and you know they're looking for more than simply um, technical delivery in court and all of this means for you and for I that we need to be a little bit more savvy in how we promote ourselves and our respective businesses um, to compete in this changing environment. I think also it's worth um, dwelling on what could be learned from listening to the views of solicitors in the marketplace and their experiences in dealing with barristers because there's a lot of commonality in the feedback that we get from lawyers. They say to us, look, um, got a very good relationship with the head clerk at X chambers, but to be quite frank, I only know two or three members. The barristers are simply not visible enough. If I was to get to know a few more of them, then I would be in a position to perhaps instruct that chambers more often. Building on that point, what they go on to say is that they want to understand the personality of those members in chambers because it isn't just about technical delivery and they're trying to match barristers to their particular clients and they need to have a high degree of confidence that those barristers are going to present them in a positive light because effectively you know you're acting as brand ambassadors for a lawyer or for uh, a, a law firm. What they also say is that on the one hand they, they applaud chambers for putting in place seminars or getting involved in perhaps in-house training but the delivery often lets barristers down because that delivery is too focused on technical information. Now, whatever it says on the, on, on the tin, i.e. this is a technical update, the reality is that people want to be engaged and they want to see some personality, they want material to be delivered in an engaging way um, where one, it's of interest and two, they get a, 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 a uh, an insight into the personality of the person delivering that material. Yet unfortunately too often that's not the experience that certainly the lawyers that we've interviewed have. Okay, so it's a changing marketplace and you've got buyers that are increasingly demanding. Um, in light of all of that, what should your marketing strategy be? Now, when I refer to marketing strategy, a couple of things spring to mind. The first thing is you might well be thinking, well, we don't have any strategy. That may well be the case. Um, and that's not the only issue. The second issue is that actually you've got two or arguably even three challenges in terms of strategy. You've got the marketing of the chambers and then you've got the marketing of the individual barristers. And arguably there's a third element too, which is the promotion of a particular practice area or you might call it a special interest group or you might call it a department. Um, but all of that requires um, a lot of focus and a lot of attention. Now traditionally the way that chambers and certainly law firms have gone about marketing has involved what I call checkbook marketing. And checkbook marketing is about 
I think, abdicating responsibility largely. It's about producing sales collateral, like brochures, like flyers, um, perhaps um, with an advertising budget to support that. And perhaps periodically, so once a year, having a big event where you invite all the people you know. And certainly in the case of lawyers, perhaps more so than barristers, it can be about the golf course and playing golf with your mates. Now, all of those things have their place. I'm not rubbishing any of them, but actually um, that isn't enough. Um, and what's required today is a far more joined up, strategic, sophisticated approach to marketing. And at Ten and a Half Boots, we call that intelligent marketing. Um, and it's about shifting the emphasis from writing checks to taking personal responsibility and getting visible in a very targeted and focused way with your key markets. Okay, what do we mean by visibility? Um, at Ten and a Half, we take the view that, that marketing and business development are largely misunderstood, and we would replace the words marketing and business development with another word, much simpler word, visibility. Visibility is about investing in relationships, primarily for barristers who are going to be solicitors, but not exclusively, and it's about getting involved. It's about participation rather than simply just turning up, perhaps um, with, with a... a um, a negative outlook at, at, at events. It's about actually getting involved, getting engaged, uh, perhaps staying in court. It's about talking to solicitors at conferences and at events. It's about really raising the profile of individual members and chambers and wider uh, uh, community um, to get visible so that people know who you are, they know what you're about, and they think of you at that point in time when they have a business need. So let's look at this visibility a little bit closer and break it down into bite-sized chunks. I want to draw your attention initially to the, the box in the middle of that page. That's the existing clients. The most important group to get visible to aren't new people at all. They're actually people you already know. It should start off with an analysis of your case history over the last two or three years and an understanding of where those instructions have come from and then putting together a plan, a, a, a systematic plan to stay visible, um, to have conversations with those people over the 12 months ahead. Um, that's the place to start. After that, the next stage is, to, is prospects. That's the box on the left-hand side. And that's about identifying in your region who are the law firms, who are the individual lawyers that are in a position to instruct barristers. And ha again, having a coffee plan, or a plan, I use the word coffee because it's simple, it's cost effective, and anyone can do it, um, how you can stay visible in the next 12 months. And thirdly, the wider professional network, because there's an awful lot of value in building your network, not just with solicitors, but the wider community, um, and you know, being seen as a go-to person, and actually tapping into other people's networks so that they are in a position to, to help you as well. What we've done at Ten and a Half is we've built a three-step model to build visibility and this is one that anyone that's tuned in this afternoon um, can use. It's very, very simple. The three stages of this. Stage number one is simply about getting out. Getting out more often. Forget about touting. Forget about instructions and simply focus on getting out. Getting visible and generating leads. How do you generate leads? You have conversations with people. Second step is about getting on with people and that's really about taking things to the next stage. That's about how you cultivate relationships, how you develop those introductions to stay visible with people so that at the point in time when they have a need they go to you to instruct and not somebody else. And thirdly, this is the pinnacle really of visibility, this is about positioning yourself as an expert, as a go-to person, and we'll give you some examples a little bit later on of people that have done this very, very successfully. And this is about being seen effectively as a confidant, as a trusted advisor, so people go to you, and actually it almost feels like there is no selling at all because your name is synonymous with a particular need in a particular marketplace. Okay, so let's go through each of those stages in turn. Firstly, getting out. Well, 
I don't want to be massively prescriptive about this. Um, the first thing to do is actually to analyze what you're doing already and to um, have identified what's working for you. And this recognizes that, you know, different barristers have got different personalities, different skill sets, different motivations, and actually, um, therefore, that should be the focus of your activity. But the starting point is knowing what's working and then replicating it. I come back to coffee again. You'll hear me uh, talk about coffee a lot, both in this webinar and in other conversations that we have, because it's the simplest way of building visibility. And that visibility can take the form of these three groups I've identified on this chart. The first one is clients. And you can look at clients as, uh, in two ways. Those that you are currently instructing you, and perhaps those that have in the past that we've called lapsed clients. If they've instructed you in the past, if you were to get visible again and politely remind them that you exist, maybe you'll get more instructions for them in the future. The second group is actually getting closer to chambers and, and perhaps moving from a silo mentality to work closer with your colleagues across chambers um, because there's other opportunities to be had there. And then there's the referrers, both lawyers and the wider professional services network. And again, it all comes down to getting face time with people simply get in front of people and drink coffee. You know what, you can drink tea as well, or even perhaps something stronger. Okay, um, the easiest way to do this is simply uh, to, to stay in court longer. Now, I recognize that won't always be possible, and one of the challenges that we get is barristers say to me, well, that's a great idea in principle, but the lawyers um, that I'm uh, working with are simply too busy to do that. Well, fine. Um, grab them, have a, a brief conversation and make a promise, make a commitment to follow up outside court and then do that via email um, and they will respond positively and um, I, I, I'm going to be a bit of a stickler here, um, uh, a little bit pig-headed. Uh, I, I, if you're of the view that all lawyers are too busy, then, then you're wrong. They might be too busy at that point in time, but they do value Indeed, they welcome approaches from barristers. And you may be surprised to learn, it's not uncommon for me to hear from lawyers that they don't know of barristers to instruct, or they know very, very few. Their options are limited because um, people just aren't at the forefront of their minds. So it really is worth following up. And indeed, there is value for the lawyer in that follow-up because they value the, let's call it professional gossip. They value... Um, your insight into what's happening in whatever markets that you're working in. So what do the coffee conversations look like? The coffee conversations are not formal conversations, they're not pitches, they're not the hard sell. They're about, at an emotional level, getting closer to your clients and having a dialogue with them over time so they understand what you're about and you can demonstrate to your client that you understand the issues are pertinent and the nuances of that particular industry or that particular sector. You know a coffee conversation is going well if the other party is doing the majority of the talking and broadly you know that should be 70 percent uh, the, 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 the lawyer, 30 percent yourself uh, and that will work if you make the lawyer feel sufficiently comfortable, if you built rapport with the lawyer, they will feel comfortable talking about themselves and their business and the market and what's going on, and it will be relatively easy to strike up a conversation. Now, um, I know that many of you that have tuned in will already be attending events. It may well be that your chambers routinely, as part of their own marketing strategy, uh, have in-house events. It may be that uh, you go to uh, training events with your clients, but are you attending or are you participating? Are you really getting involved or are you one of those barristers that goes to an event, um, probably looking a bit glum, at the earliest opportunity leaves? Um, I've had some a lawyer say to me recently, they were, they were quite uh, flabbergasted when they attended a conference and yet many of the barristers left sometime before the end. Besides it being bad from a marketing point of view, it's downright rude, <laughs> so uh, don't do it. Um, those people that uh, get their hands dirty, that make the effort, that engage, that participate, will reap the benefits. And if you do get opportunities to talk at a platform, whether that's an in-house event or a training activity, 
do take the opportunity because assuming that you focus on the engagement and uh, you describe you are able to form a high emotional connection with your audience um, there is in my opinion no better way than to generate leads okay um, the other thing I often hear from lawyers is they say okay I met so-and-so a member at an event or in court and uh, that was great but they didn't follow up they missed the opportunity um, to continue that conversation because they didn't feel it was appropriate or for whatever reason they, would, they perceived they were too busy they didn't follow up please 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 if you don't do anything else after this webinar follow up on opportunities leads uh, that you've already got and the email that you see in front of you now uh, I want you to take a wild leap of faith and trust me I've been using this very email or more importantly my clients have been using this email for nearly nine years now and it works now does it mean that on receipt of this email you will get instructed no probably not what it does mean 85 to 90 percent of the time is that you will get a cup of coffee and it's the cup of coffee that enables you to um, build rapport, cultivate relationships. If you like, think of it as a, as a staircase of trust. And at the top of that staircase of trust, there's an instruction or maybe a whole stream of instructions. And what you've got to do is move up that staircase, it, which may have many, many steps, indeed many cups of coffee. This email is simply a, a stage and a process to move you up that staircase. And it works. That's the important point it works try it um, when we talk about getting out and visibility um, there are other things you can do in terms of building a wider professional network and what you will find today up and down the country is that there are literally thousands of opportunities to grow your network formally and just a small snapshot of them is on the chart that you see in front of you now um, if one doesn't exist already, you could set one up. But there are networking opportunities um, for just about anything. And it's all about, again, getting visible, building your network, and um, building a contact base. And it's increasing the odds of getting the instruction. That's what it's about, stacking the odds in your favor. That's the best that you can do. And what I'd encourage you to do is to be very creative in how you think about doing this. You know, where can you meet people? It's not just the obvious places. It may be within the community. It might be involved in charities. Maybe that you're a school governor. It might be at the rugby pitch. It could be at the football pitch, whatever. It's about finding places to meet people, getting on with people, uh, making people feel comfortable, um, adding value um, and following up now um, the chart you in, you see in front of you there um, that really is a summary of all of the strategies that I would describe as intelligent marketing these ten and a half activities really summarize the ten and a half approach to intelligent marketing and if I had my way every barrister in every chambers up and down the country would cut out that guide, stick it on their, above their computer as a reminder of the things they should be doing to get visible. Um, it works, that's the bottom line. You'll see no reference to advertising, no reference to brochures, no reference to sponsorship, no reference to golf days either. Um, those are the things that work. They don't necessarily involve spending much money. In fact, very often they don't. They do involve an investment of time. And, you know, Probably the thing that's getting in the way more than anything else isn't the strategy, it's a mindset. It's a mindset that says, I can't do this because I'm a professional and for me to drink coffee or to engage with these people, somehow that means I'm touting or to use the word that uh, one certain barrister that's remained nameless used last week in a workshop was prostitution. This isn't about touting. This isn't about prostitution. This is about getting real and being commercial in 2013 and actually getting visible in your market. And if you're not prepared to do it, there will be barristers and other chambers that are, and they will reap the benefits, not you. Now, um, time doesn't permit to go through each of these individually. We've, we've touched on two or three. I just want to draw attention to one more that we haven't mentioned, and that's number five, saw this and thought of you. I want to home in on this one because it's so, so simple. It doesn't involve you walking into a room full of strangers. 
It's as simple as this. Having done the analysis that I suggested you do right at the start, which is looking at existing client relationships and identifying those people that have instructed you in the past, it's about um, uh, understanding what it is that, that um, motivates those people, what are their interests, and then building a system to collect information either by using Google Alerts or by just um, taking articles out of magazines, hard copy or electronic, and then sending people those articles or those features, those bulletins, those news items, and literally saying, saw this and thought of you. And a combination of business, professional, and sometimes personal works perfectly. Why does it work? Well, firstly, it's a little bit of a jolt. It keeps you visible. It keeps you on the radar of those people who you're trying to influence. Arguably, as important as all of that, what it does is say to that person, that you're thinking of them, you're actually adding value and um, you're investing in that relationship. You're going the extra mile, if you like. You're doing more than the minimum, which is um, you know, delivering um, on a particular matter in court. Um, Source and thought of you cost no more than a postage stamp, except the cost of postage has gone up recently. But putting that to one side, it's a very inexpensive method to stay visible and cultivate relationships. Okay, you can look at all the other uh, items on there in, in your own time because you will have these slides to look at at your leisure. So remember I said the three step model, step one is getting out there, focusing on leads, not instructions. We've done that. Next stage is actually getting on with people. This is about cultivating relationships. Um, a lot of barristers are disappointed when they've talked at an event but the instructions don't follow and this is because it isn't enough just to give a talk at an event. You've got to be omnipresent in the minds of your contacts. Um, you've got to be adding value um, over 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Um, we want a, a client this week that we've been talking to for seven years now, uh, a law firm. Seven years of talking to them. They finally instructed us. I won't embarrass them because they should have got there sooner, shouldn't they? But there we go. Um, so how do you cultivate these relationships? Well. What I'd say at the beginning is have a system. Now, this doesn't require you to do what many of the bigger law firms have done and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on very sophisticated client relationship management systems or marketing databases. But you need a system, and this is about not just leaving things to chance or being reactive or leaving it to memory. If you do that, um, people will slip between the cracks that you have forgotten about and the the distance in time, the gaps in time will get longer and longer and longer. A system might look something like this. It could be a, a, um, a whiteboard. It, it could be uh, an Excel spreadsheet where you're tracking conversations with people and you're planning ahead in your diary for when you are going to contact people um, by email, by telephone, to get those coffees, to meet people at events, perhaps to engage in, uh, in, in hospitality events as well. But you need a system, and that system um, should be proactive and focused. One way to focus that is to segment your contacts. Now, for those of you perhaps that are uh, senior clerks that have dialed in, that have a database maybe that goes into three or 4,000 or even more contacts, it's very difficult and indeed wouldn't be practical to manage coffees for all of those people. So what I'm suggesting is you break people down into different groupings and allocate um, a marketing investment accordingly. So it may be um, you know, at the bottom of the ladder, if you like, at the bottom of the pyramid, at the bronze level, that's simply about putting people on a database and sending them electronic newsletters. Very inexpensive and doesn't involve even as much as a cup of coffee. At the silver level, you may take the view there's a smaller group of people that perhaps once a year you should have a cup of coffee with. And you can see how this works. At gold level, it may be they get invited to more than perhaps a hospitality event. And platinum may be that you give them a, a lot more of your time and investment and perhaps deliver perhaps free in-house training because um, there is a lot of potential in the value of that relationship not just in terms of instructions but in terms of potentially referral to other people and um, also strategically in terms of the, the strategic value of attracting new business by being seen to do business with a particular organization or a particular lawyer. 
if there's one thing that you do need to do, it's more. Um, now, depending upon what research you buy into, um, research shows that people rarely buy before five, six, seven touches. What do I mean by touches? Well, it's really employing some of the strategies, some of the intelligent marketing strategies you can see in the balloons, that's the or the circles on the right-hand side. Um, it's rarely one thing that drives the instruction. It's the combination. It's the sum of the parts. But quite simply, most barristers don't do enough. They don't do enough. They don't do enough regularly enough. A little and often is far more effective than big bang annual events. I think it's important to say at this juncture that getting on is more than just doing stuff. It's about an emotional connection. It's about actually getting on with people. And far too often I hear uh, quite senior partners in law firms say to me that whatever the technical credentials of particular QCs or particular barristers, they wouldn't, in their words, touch them with a the barge pole because there is no emotional connecti connectivity there whatsoever. So, you know, think about how you can spend more time getting closer to people on a personal basis. And this doesn't mean schmoozing. It doesn't mean touting. It simply means disclosing something of who you are, getting to know people and getting on with people. And, you know, that could be as simple as, you know, being seen regularly in the, in the, in the same pub. Um, the bottom left-hand corner, for those of you who've tuned in from Nottingham, you'll know that that's a pub called The Castle, which surprisingly is near, yeah, you guessed it, The Castle. Um, and many lawyers of some of the big law firms in Nottingham uh, meet there routinely on a very informal basis every Friday evening. So if you're a barrister trying to get instructions in Nottingham, you know what, you could do, uh, could do worse than being in The Castle on a Friday night um, and being seen to be there and just, you know, being warm, being open, being friendly, maybe even smiling. And, you know, be creative about this. There's a picture of me in the bottom right-hand corner. No, it isn't. Not really. Um, you know, what course rated activities can you get involved with? How can you get more involved in the community? How can you um, get involved in activities with your contacts? You know, perhaps it may be you work together, um, you may even run together in a marathon. Going the extra mile, what does this mean? It's one of these really overused terms, but I'll tell you what it means. There's a law firm down on the south coast called Fretton's. They're an independent uh, law firm, and going the extra mile for them means, in a case of one particular probate matter, um, taking a dog um, under their wings after the owner died, um, because they knew that the owner cared about the dog and there was no one else to look after the dog. So they took Elsie under their wings and looked after the dog. That's what going the extra mile means. Um, we've got an accountancy client we were working with and um, um, during the course of a meeting, end of the day, the secretary walked in and said, uh, Martin, you do realise this um, tender document has to be with the client by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and at which point, our response as well, we're literally passing the door, um, we'll drop it in for you. Now bear in mind that door was 90 miles away from this client's office, um, but it wasn't going out of our way or mildly out of our way because we were driving to London anyway the following morning. It's about doing more than what's expected. Think about how that can manifest itself for you. It could be about making yourself available outside 9 to 5, it might be about giving a personal telephone number, um, it might be in the case of one barrister I know contacting the lawyer after a, after a particular case and inquiring as to how their client was um, after quite a traumatic experience, showing that you care. So three-step model. Uh, step number one, getting out there. You're now engaged in more activity. You're visible in the marketplace. You've now thought about the, recognize the fact you need to do more to cultivate the relationship and you're doing more than just the annual event. How do you move to the next level, which is getting in? Um, and this is about not being viewed as a supplier anymore, but seen as a genuine partner. Why have we got a picture of a swimming pool in the south of France? Well, the reason is that swimming pool belongs to a client of ours who makes that facility available to us because over a number of years, we've delivered far more than um, the strict terms of reference, which might in this case mean delivering some training workshops. We've been there for the client, we've done more than the minimum, and as a consequence of that, that is reciprocated. 
This is about trust. Remember earlier on I talked about the trust staircase. Now, many of your clients, many of the lawyers that you're working with um, will be familiar with somebody called David Meister. David Meister started writing in the legal sector in the late 1980s and his seminal book was called The Trusted Advisor. If you haven't read this book already, I strongly recommend you do read this book not just because the principles have as much applicability in my opinion for barristers as they do lawyers but because if it's important to your lawyers and they're reading the book or they have read the book you should do too it will get you uh, closer to understanding where they're coming from and what their expectations are as they raise their game for their clients um, but it's about uh, consistency of delivery and client care and doing more than simply dealing with the, the technical aspects of a particular matter. Okay, um, what you see on this chart here is four particular individuals who in my opinion are great proponents of the whole concept of intelligent marketing. You see Nick Freeman, Mr. Loophole, any celebrity who gets caught speeding, or it's, there's a strong probability I should say, any celebrity who gets caught speeding will pick up the telephone to Mr. Loophole who has positioned himself as the go-to person in his respective sector and therefore is seen as a thought leader. Mark Stevens next to Nick. Mark Stevens, IP lawyer. Again, a lot of media cases, Mark Stevens is perceived as the go-to person and gets the phone call to appear on a radio program um, to give his perspective. Fiona Shackleton, family lawyer. Again, very similar, um, uh, an exam exemplar of, of practicing intelligent marketing and uh, has a queue of high profile people uh, instructing her on family cases. And then Daniel Barnett, a barrister, an employment barrister, who again is commercially very, very successful. Why is he successful? Same as Fiona, same as Mark, same as Nick. They are exemplars of intelligent marketing. They do all the things I've been talking about over the last 35 minutes or so. They practice intelligent marketing. Now here's the interesting thing. In each of these four cases, um, Advocates have said to me they are not necessarily the most technically gifted, most technically brilliant solicitors or barristers. Well, that as may be, but this, is, this webinar is not about technical brilliance. It's about marketing brilliance, and these four individuals are successful. And uh, You know, when people instruct you, they are going to make an assumption you can deliver a certain level of technical competence but it's that something else that will decide whether you get the instruction or somebody else gets the instruction and you know learn from these four individuals because these individuals um, interestingly haven't tuned into this particular webinar presumably because they've got uh, some pretty lucrative clients and are extremely busy um, at this point in time. What they all do is the five P's. They all have presence. They're passionate about what they do. They're high profile. They've invested over many years in building a network and have a very professional approach to marketing. Um, marketing should be delivered in a professional manner in the way that I've been uh, talking about during the course of this webinar. It requires a certain mindset and motivation. It requires the um, preparedness to be available for interviews, to be prepared to write articles, to be there to talk at industry events. But more than anything else, it's a mindset that says this isn't about touting and prostitution. This is part of one's day job. Marketing done professionally is as important as delivering the technical aspects of one's job. You're going to do that anyway. Marketing needs to be built into the way that you go about your everyday business so that you get those instructions. It's about visibility. Okay, a few final thoughts to share with you. Um, first impressions are really important. I know barristers um, that within 30 seconds of meeting lawyers that has been the end of the relationship because they haven't presented themselves very well and this manifests itself in many many ways. For those of you that have the pleasure of meeting my business partner Doug McPherson I challenge you to find anybody who's got a shinier pair of shoes. Um, 
it might manifest itself in being punctual in court. I know um, another barrister who loses a lot of work simply because he's regularly late in court. He's a very charming individual, he's a very good barrister, but he loses cases because he's late in court. Impressions are important. What can you do in your style of delivery, in your style of engagement with people that means you get more instructions? Okay, um, it's about looking more attractive. Why have I put pictures here of Mary Portas and Alan Hansen? Well, it's for this reason. Neither of them are in their first flushes of youth. Neither of them are models, but they both they both make the best of what they've got. They both um, invest some time in their appearance and projecting themselves well. The benefit of that is not only do they come across better, but they're more confident in themselves, which means in turn they project themselves better. It doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune on clothes and appearances or involve cosmetic surgery either. It simply means presenting yourself well. Okay, so let's take stock. Where are we? This is where we are. Being successful in 2013 requires more than being technically a brilliant barrister. It requires marketing in a grown-up way, not the old-fashioned way, which is willy-nilly walking into a room full of strangers going to formal events, willy-nilly sending um, present, um, brochures, or uh, sponsoring activities. It re requires an understanding and the adoption of intelligent marketing in the very way that Nick Freeman, Fiona Shackleton, Mark Stevens, Daniel Barnett all do consistently. It requires the adoption of that three-step model, um, getting out there, being visible, getting on with people and then really getting in, taking the relationship to another level. Now, I recognize that in terms of taking action and next steps, it won't necessarily look the same for everybody that's tuned in or listening to this webinar. It's about recognizing that we all have different personalities and it's about leveraging those particular talents, those particular strengths. All I would say is this, take action. Now, that action may be honing networking skills, honing presentation skills, employing solace and thought of you, um, being keener to accept opportunities to get articles published and forming relationships with journalists. Whatever it is, do something, do it well, and do it consistently. It does require you to follow up, and it requires you to follow up consistently. So many opportunities are wasted because people simply don't follow up. What is the outcome of the follow up? The outcome of the follow up is drinking coffee with people that you know largely. It's going back to that model of visibility that I shared with you right at the outset, um, following up and drinking coffee. Okay, I'm hoping that you found something there of use. Um, be delighted to continue the conversation another time. And you, there's, there's two options here. Uh, by all means, contact the Bar Council directly and we can continue the conversation there. Or if you prefer, and if you're comfortable, at Ten and a Half Boots, myself, that's Bernard Savage, and my business partner, Douglas McPherson, will be delighted to hear from you. You've got our contact details there. You know where we are. Um, in the meantime, do something, drink coffee, and enjoy it too. Thank you, and goodbye.